to the Congo, raping women and children. Um, when you see uh, two nation, African nations in conflict, um, you can bet that uh, right behind them there's a Western country profiting from whatever conflict there is. Because um, with the uh, minerals um, regulations, when there is conflict in a country, those mine uh, companies don't have to abide by the, uh, the, the rules of extracting minerals. And so um, uh, the multinational and international corporations, um, they see no benefit in having uh, that conflict end. And so um, the people that are attacking women and children in the Congo are being funded by the West, the United States included. Uh, England, uh, Canada, all of these people are profiting from those minerals. And uh, in the meantime, um, the uh, conflict in the Congo has a death toll that is uh, the second to the, the World War uh, death toll. And uh, no, none of those uh, companies or corporations uh, want to shed light on it. Everybody say, well, we don't have uh, uh, blood minerals, you know, but uh, they control, they, they are going around the, the the system into uh, um, into to serving themselves basically, but uh, I want to touch a little bit uh, on what the lady said, and I really agree. I think that the the, uh, the, the issue, the challenge of this 21st century, is uh, very much a moral challenge, you know, because um, the killings and, and the rapings and the, the sex trafficking that's going on in the world, it's a moral issue, you know. People um, like you and me have to take a stand. And uh, we should be able to tell the people that govern us that it's not acceptable that women and children be raped and killed so that we can have um, the ultimate uh, modern um, sophisticated uh, uh, devices. We need to say that uh, you are not gonna, we are not going to patronize you if you're going to kill for it. There's no reason why in order to mine uh, the minerals people should be killed. And so um, it's a moral issue, and we really have to uh, take on that, uh, um, that challenge in the 21st century, because uh, it's about ethics, about morals, it's about people caring for people, and um, uh, beyond um, our quest for modernism, because we can be so sophisticated in our devices um, and be living in ultra-modernism, yet our um, mind, free mind, and our um, Humanity is reverting to Stone Age, and that is not right. We should take a stand for what's going on. Oh, you want to get a response to that? I, I, um, I want to touch upon what you said about m m being a moral issue, and that's absolutely right. And I think we have to start making that shift, particularly when it comes to human trafficking, uh, jail for profit prison for profit, you know, those, those are all, for lack of a better term, business decisions, you know, um, and this is, and obviously I'm talking from their point of view, but when you have human trafficking, you know, uh, for, uh, from their point of view, there's no, there's no business overhead, it's a human body. So we have to make that, we have to make that, sh that shift from business to moral conscience, so that we know, no, so that they can see it as a human being and not as, uh, you know, not having to buy office furniture or something like that to create a business. You know, that, that's, why, that's why it's so prevalent, is because it's 100% profit to them. And so that's, that's why when you said that, that's, I really want to touch upon that and really expound on that and say that's, that's the shift that we really do need to make. You know, the shift from the, seeing it as money and, uh, to seeing human beings. Okay, last question. Have, has there been an attempt to demonize any of you for the work that you all are doing regarding this issue. No smear campaigns, no uh, knocks on the doors, no black cars following you, anything like that? Heavy breathing on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say at this moment that I know of any uh, demonizing or harassment uh, campaigns or, or smear harassment campaigns, but for me, I feel like even in the last couple of years, my work is just beginning. Um, so I, I mean, and I'm actually a, a licensed mental health specialist, so I get a lot of flack because I'm constantly talking to people about mental health wellness and, and what that means and the language that we use and um, how much 
we have better we have to do with our health care to ensure that people get the right coverage to treat severe chronic mental <coughs> issues. And I see human trafficking as a psychological ill of our society um, that is supported uh, narrowly and ignorantly by a lot of us. Um, so, no, I don't think so, but I think uh, it could be coming. Um, and I think that if so, you know, so be it. I don't think that the work that you do that you're passionate about is going to be easy or uh, sexy and people are going to like you for it necessarily. I think that when you do something that is about creating justice and equality for people who are the underdog, it's going to attract a lot of um, spite, it's going to attract a lot of attention, it's going to attract a lot of different things that you can't sometimes envision. But if you are really about creating an impact, you have to accept that it's going to come. Like Ms. Asha said, I have not faced any hate campaigns against me or um, any black cars following me or phone calls or a knock on the door. But um, if I ever, I still have a long life ahead of me, and if I ever do face that, I'm going to stand up and say, I don't care. Because I'm going to keep on doing what I have to do until no girl, boy, no child has to go through that again. Because right now, I have a great life. And I am privileged not to be in the same position as one of those girls. So I'm going to do whatever I can to help one of the, to help a girl or a boy who is going through that. So I really don't care what you put up again about me, give me on social media. I really don't care. I mean, I've never gotten any kind of smear campaign, but I, you know, we occasionally, and I'm sure that so many people get this, you know, um, especially if you work on things overseas and you hear people say, like, well, why don't you do stuff here? Or, or if you work here, people say, well, there's starving kids overseas, why don't you do that? My answer to that is, well, I'm, I'm working on that, so why don't you? That's a position that needs to be filled, so, and, and they, need, they need employment right now. So. Now, if anyone else wants to take on that question, please be very brief because we're about to open the floor up to the audience. I was just going to say, it's not so much demonization, but as Rob said, it's sometimes dismissiveness or derision. It's kind of like, well, you're not really going to make a difference, so why bother? Yeah. What about you? Um, most of the uh, um, challenges that we've had to face is really sabotage because um, uh, in the community we try to uh, spread awareness and uh, we have groups of uh, uh, meetings and we make plans and uh, sometimes we have people infiltrating our meetings and um, all of a sudden I think is, everything is going wrong and uh, what happened, why, why the division and some people just come in. They, who, who knows who sends them to just to create the, the diversion and, and, and division. Uh, but uh, most of the communities, of uh, Congolese community in Europe, in France, Belgium, uh, uh, England, uh, um, Australia, and South Africa, and, and other different countries, they uh, face a lot of uh, uh, trials because um, when they uh, uh, march in the street, uh, people want to um, demonize them as people just that are creating uh, disturbance in their host countries and um, so uh, we always have to explain that uh, we, uh, we appreciate the countries uh, that are hosting us, you know, but um, as for myself, I'm, I'm a, a Congolese American and so uh, I can't do away with the Congolese that, that's, that's ahead of the American part because that's my ancestry and uh, um, these are, these are the, the, that's where my heart is and I appreciate the host the country but uh, uh, these are the things that people try to, to, to demonize you with for fighting for, you know, your... We, we appreciate it. We're not going to open up the floor to questions. Anyone want to come up there? Anyone, anything to say to our panelists? Well, this, there is a solution. Quite a skip. I'm treating okay? Okay, like me? Okay. Please, the microphone, but, you know, anyone else, family, please, because you were there. I'm going to leave the solution, but the key to this, and I read, I was reading Mr. Um, Michel Alexander's book, The, um, Prison Club, because the prison industrial complex are cousins and partners with the uh, property industrial complex. Well, everything you talk about comes down to one thing, education, because it starts at the community level, the community plan board, and school board. When nothing happens, every community has one. If nothing happens, let it go to the community plan board. When you talk about slavery, you talk about policy and, uh, and the age that's tolerated in communities. And quite as kept, when I sit on the policing council meeting, 
um, slavery and prostitution are not what you call high brawly on the criminal on the criminal cell. They, they call it's not what we call glamorous. They're doing other things. So until the community gets go to the community board, the local policing board, and school board, and push the issue, the politicians not going to do nothing. Go on the address and just get reelected and credit the paycheck. And I know it's when you push more on one particular issue, also you do get a reaction. Because number one, a whole lot of stuff is happening in various communities with deals in real estate. And well, we've seen that happen um, basically when um, the certain, as long as you don't make no noise, it will keep on going on and on. And police will walk by, they don't pay nobody, because nobody's making a complaint. So when we go back to educating the public through local community planning boards and every other board out there, they even see a change in the policy. You have to stand right down. Even the prison system is not high up on the um, awareness scale because nobody wants to hear about it until the states get broke and then you might have to come to somewhere to keep it going on. So until you go down to the local community board level, which I said and worked for 12 years over in Bronx County, and push the issue until I got pulled off the board, uh, it's not going to get noticed. That's the only way you can deal with it uh, by educating the public and getting involved in the local community. out there um, organizations that work with and promote sex workers uh, in, in, in terms of harm reduction. Is it ever, or have you had a working experience where you've worked with these organizations? In fact, there was uh, um, um, a big um, seminar in Las Vegas last year, and I think there will be another one this year in Washington, that will be connected with the AIDS conference. Are you familiar with? No, no, no. Uh, are you familiar with some of the sex worker organizations? No. Okay. And did you do time from time to connect with them? I don't know if everyone heard his question, but the question was, do I connect to other organizations that particularly promote harm reduction when it comes to sex trafficking, and that's actually the majority of the work that the collective advocates that I founded is doing. So for years, I was looking just to honestly mentor young girls who had been trafficked, and there were so many um, waiting lists to become a mentor, which was kind of surprising that I just ended up creating my own group of people who worked with me to raise awareness, and there are tons of them right here in New York. Um, there's some in DC, as I mentioned earlier. There's GEMS that is one of New York's first premier um, anti-human trafficking organizations it's on 116th Street, and they do work in the community to get girls out of the sex industry. As a matter of fact, one of the young ladies who was in the film Not My Life is from that organization, and they are in need of funds. They need people to come in and uh, do work to help the young girls in the program. Um, I actually worked with the Polaris Project, who was also mentioned in the film, the guy who uh, is the executive director Bradley Miles, we um, did some work when walking on Marching on Washington this past September that where Victoria actually spoke. So we're constantly trying to raise awareness and funds and get people talking and, and even during the holiday season trying to encourage people to spend their dollars in a different way. So instead of going out and shopping at some retail stores, you can do things like promote women who have been rescued, who are making jewelry to afford a living. So we promote through social media that way. We are also out here trying to give out the uh, human trafficking hotline so people, as they start to recognize signs of people who are victims of this issue, can call in a tip, can ask for resources, can even, if they have um, an organization they are part of, get training in. Um, so yes, definitely. Are you, are. Fam are you familiar with um, the threat and, and the uh, jewelry you got there? Okay, and right now um, I have a, uh, a relationship with the U.S. Fund for UNICEF, which
which is the United States Funds Division of Human Trafficking. They have an end traffic project that raises awareness as trafficking affects people in the U.S. So we have been showing this film to students uptown. Um, they're going to also be doing a screening possibly at the Schomburg next month. Um, a colleague of mine named Brooke Bellow has a documentary, Above the Noise. She's a human traffic survivor, and she has a documentary where she shows this film and does a Q&A as well. And we're trying to actually work with an organization called Black and Missing Foundation that's based in Washington, D.C., to bridge the relationship between kids of color who go missing and trafficked victims as well. So yes, we're doing a lot of work in that area to build coalitions. Anyone else?
It's a little complicated, you know. It's a, I just want to put it like that. It is complicated. <laughs> I've tried. It's complicated. Um, but I know that you wanted to say something. Um, I what, what's your name? Okay. Thank you. So if, when we have our campaign, we want you to be our campaign manager because you are like really good about speaking about this issue. No, I, I totally agree 100%. I think um, there, there have been a lot of people who actually talked about it in the media and actually the entire summer, all of the major African American magazines from Essence and Ebony have done articles on this. So my colleague, Brooke Bellow, who I mentioned earlier, she's an American human traffic survivor. She was featured in, um, I think it was Ebony Magazine in June, and then she was in Essence Magazine in July. She was on all different programs on television, and she's been on the radio. And her film would have been shown last month, or this month, actually, the Schomburg, but because of um, the hurricane, she got displaced, and so they're gonna be showing it in January. So we are bringing it to the community. The community has to look for it and come out and support us because we're also coming to you. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have our advocates out in the street in January and through the winter and spring months to just get the human trafficking hotline out on the street. Um, I actually attend some of the community affairs meetings through the 32nd Precinct in Harlem. So we do get out and we do talk to the community. We do have young advocates like this who have been on the radio and she's actually gonna be on, um, I'm on a blog talk radio show that has about 14,000 listeners. And so we're going to be on the air. She's going to be our first guest of the year talking about change makers and human trafficking. So you guys can actually follow us um, on social media and get our cards and find out how you can tune in and listen and ask questions. But, you know, January 3rd, thank you very much on Blog Talk Radio. She's going to be our first guest. We do think that you're absolutely right. It has to draw a lot of attention to it. But let me tell you, we had the Polaris Project who, um, with legislation created the human trafficking hotline number um, on the mall in Washington in September and you know not to minimize the work that everyone did to get there but they probably had about 2,000 people with with about 20 plus organizations that were worldwide come and have a table and Everybody was there giving out information about their organizations both globally and locally and we had about 2,000 people come out and they worked for months to raise awareness and to get people to come and donate a small $10 to just register to be there and get a shirt and come out and support the work that people like Victoria and Brooke and others are doing to make this happen. So going back to what we said earlier, it has to be an issue that you care about. So it's not that people aren't aware of it completely or don't know that there are events that go on or, or are not on social media. I find out things about this every day on social media through CNN, through all different types of organizations and campaigns and celebrities, etc. on and on and on, even here in Harlem. But people have to care enough to want to know more and to know how they can get active to make the change happen. And that's at all levels and all ages and all ethnic groups. It can't just be a couple of people with a few dollars or some free time to want to be active. It has to be everybody does something because everybody's position is important. So if you write the letter and I go and speak and someone else hands out a t-shirt or you give out a flyer, all of those roles are important, but everybody has to play a part in the change game. Okay, we have two more. Uh, 
not so much the media, because the media has its own Gender. fault to blame. Yeah. But there's also that thing that people have to get past that you're still dealing with human beings, no matter what happens. A 13-year-old girl is assaulted. It's not her fault. You don't ask what she had on. You know, so who's that? So I guess it was just a statement. with everybody. Uh, I think that there has to be a political will um, from our, uh, um, the people that govern us. Um, Hillary Clinton has gone to the Congo so many times um, to the point that the uh, leader of the uh, hospital Panzi, um, the place where they, uh, they, they uh, give um, care to the women that have been raped, and uh, to the point that the, 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 the general doctor there said, you know, why they keep sending uh, officials to come, and then they go, they don't do anything. And so, um, you know, it's over two million women raped and children, and um, over eight million people. It's a genocide, it's, um, the, the Jewish genocide was a six million. In the Congo, it's over eight million, yet nobody is talking about it. Hillary Clinton and uh, President Obama each individually have presided the uh, Museum for Holocaust in Washington. Um, where we are demonstrating to, to bring awareness to the genocide in the Congo, and neither one of them have ev even mentioned the genocide in the Congo um, in the Museum of uh, Holocaust in Washington. So there has to be a political will, um, and I have to agree with my brother here that maybe it is because it's about black people, and uh, there is a prejudice, and uh, uh, the people that lead us, uh, unfortunately, most of them are uh, uh, sponsored by corporations that dictate them what should be their priorities. And so that is a shame, but uh, they need to remember that people who vote for them are the regular people like you and I, and they need to see uh, the people that we care about uh, progress as well. All right, we're gonna have three more questions, but I have one and then this is the last two. Uh, my question is for Sam. Sam, since you made slavery by another name, and you know we have a lot of talk uh, and outrage about slavery in the past, how come you don't think we have the same outrage about slavery in the present? I think it goes back to education. I think that, uh, you know, that, you know, in our schools, people don't get the education to understand about the past and understand how it's, you know, it permeates what's happening today. You know, and I think it's all going back to what you were saying. It's about teaching the children. You know, it's about the policies that you were talking about, the social, political, and the public policies, you know, that this country has developed and that has nothing to do with teaching our children. Good evening, Anna. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm glad to upon you from the creator of all things good and evil. Um, I just have thoughts running around in my head of what I heard here tonight, and it's um, really, really heart wrenching on all different levels top to the bottom, from the bottom back up to the top. And uh, it all circumstances together in one vicious circle. It starts with education, and it goes on from there. And then you look back in our history, uh, from our motherland, when we were born here, robbed and raped. Fast forward a little bit, we born in civil rights. That really wasn't to free us. That was to free up, that was to break the South of their stronghold, which was the money, the power that they had, and um, the political arena.